you have your Bibles, kindly turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 10. Last year we stopped with Genesis chapter 9. Now we will continue with Genesis chapter 10. So we looked at Noah, we looked at the flood, we looked at how God rescued him through the flood, told him to construct that ark, saved him and his family, his sons and their wives through the flood. And now we're going to pick up in chapter 10 of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 10. It says, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. So all this is happening after the flood. So... Noah had three sons, and uh, the oldest one was Japheth. The middle one was, uh, was Shem, where we get the Semitic race from, and the youngest one was Ham. So, you know, when somebody said that if you read the Bible at pulpit speed, that is, that's at a speed where you're reading fast enough so that uh, everyone can understand. You're not reading so fast that nobody can understand what you're saying and you're not reading uh, very slowly either. As fast as a person can understand. That's called pulpit speed. And if you read the entire Bible at this speed, you can complete it in about 71 hours. And when you hear that and you divide that by say 365 days, that's about 12 minutes a day so you can complete the bible uh, by reading i mean one time you can read the entire bible one time if you read it 12 minutes a day and when you hear such things you are excited you get motivated sounds fun i mean if i'm if i'm disciplined i can dedicate 12 minutes of my day to reading the bible however th those kind of things become very hard when you come to genesis chapter 10 because again we have this long list of names and they're all the sons, all the people that come from uh, Noah and his sons. But we look at it because it's very important and we won't spend too much time today. We're just getting back into our Bible study. So we'll see, we will go through this chapter as quickly as possible. We're told in, in verses two, verse two, the sons of Japheth, Goma, so Japheth is the oldest son of Noah. And so in this table now, we, we, we read that um, Japheth has this one son called Goma. And from these people, from this, this guy called Japheth comes this Indo-European language. And, and it, it almost sounds contradictory because in our heads, we have this division between the East and the West. But especially, you know, when you see ethnologists, when you see linguists, they when they want to study the roots of a language, say even the English language, some of them come to India and they study Sanskrit because they know that the base is this Indo-European language. And so Japheth, from that group comes this Indo-European language. And initially they were very uncouth, they were very uncivilized group of people and there were a lot of atrocities that they committed that are recorded in history. Very evil people, uh, very dark people. But then when they embrace the God of the Semites, that is the Jewish people, there was a radical change amongst them, amongst those, amongst the people that you can call Japhethites, if you will. So the first son that is referred to is Homer. And of course, we can't spend, uh, you know, time. There are 70 nations or 70 people, individuals, 70 people, groups that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 10. We can't spend time learning about each group. Otherwise, we'll be here for a long time. So some things I'll mention, some things we'll just read through. First son that is mentioned is Gomer. And uh, this is a people group called the Cimmerians or Cimmerians. And we, have, we, can, we should not be confused with the Sumerians, that's a different group, S-U-M-E-R-I-A-N-S. This is C-I-M-M-E-R-I-A-N-S, the Sumerians or the Cimmerians, again, not the Samaritans. So from this group, they, they first settled in Asia Minor and then they migrated and they moved 
to Central Eastern Europe. And the name of that, their place was called Gomeland, Goma, Gomeland. And now it's become Cumberland. And it entails, of, I mean, it consists of places like uh, Northern England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, all these places. So these people are called the, the people of Goma. The Goma was their forefather. Then you have another person, uh, sorry, another person mentioned over there called Magog. And this, this word Magog will appear again in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And we're told in the end times that, you know, there'll be a battle of Gog and Magog. It's the same place. It's all, basically all these people from northern Russia that will form an alliance and come against Israel, the people of God. This, is, this will happen in the last days. And we're living in the last days, so not very long from now. But this is that same Magog that is mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 verses 39. And, and the people that come from this group are the ancient Russians, the Slavs, the, the Bohemians, and the Bulgarians. And also, here's an interesting fact. We know we've, we've heard of the Great Wall of China. I've never visited it. But we all know of that, one of those wonders of the world. The, the Great Wall of China, which they built for their protection, which spans more than 21,000 kilometers, I think 21,196 kilometers long, you take the whole wall into consideration. And they built it for their protection. It's called the Great Wall of China. But it used to be known as the Great Wall of Magog because the ancient Chinese people believed that it protected them from the Russian people, the ancient Russian people. So it used to be also known as the Wall of Magog. So that, that's just a fact over there. Then another group is mentioned. They're called the Madai group. I, I'm not 100% sure about the pronunciations, but M-A-D-A-I, Madai. And from them, we have, they, he's basically the father of the Medes, father of the Persians. We read about them in the book of Daniel. And um, people from there filled up places like our country, India, Iran, Afghanistan, the Kurdish people. So they all come. Their forefather is the uh, their forefather was called Madai. And then you have Javan or Yavan, and the uh, people who populated places like Greece, Macedonia, Italy, and maybe even Rome. And then you have two other places, Tubal and Meshach. Again, these two places are mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And uh, some people, again, ethnologists will say that they can even narrow it down to the cities that these two groups settled in, like more Tubal, they say modern day Tobolsk in Russia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly. And then Meshach, they settled down in Moscow. So in Russia. So th th you can trace all this, you can follow uh, all, all these lines and see where they've settled. So they really spread out. All this to say that people really spread out after the flood. And then you have uh, Tyrus and the other people who lived in the Aegean coast and um, the name of their group is Thracians. And again, you can do Google searches and you can look up their culture and the language and all, all those different things. A lot of information available online about these people. Verse 3 goes on to say, the sons of Goma, Goma Ashkenaz, Rifta, Riphat, and to Togarma. Now, these this Ashkenaz, you have these, uh, I think it, they call Ashkenazi Jews. And, and basically, these Ashkenazi Jews have had long-standing tensions with another group of Jews we call the Sephardic Jews. And they had, and most Jews, I think more than 80% are actually Ashkenazi Jews. But, and the conservative types are the Ashkenazi. But then they also have this other group called the Sephardic Jews. And they've been, they had, you know, there's a long standing conflict between these two groups. But the, the, these tensions all subsided to a great degree in the 1940s when, when, when one Japhethite, uh, came and he was, you know, anti-Semitic. He hated all the Jews. And he was Adolf Hitler. And he exterminated about 6 million of them. And it was after that, that these two groups decided to let bygones be bygones. They decided to forget their differences. And they move, many of them moved back to the land when the modern nation of Israel was formed. 
and they decided to forget all their differences. But till then, there were a lot of tensions. And so you have the Sephardic Jews and you have the Ashkenazi Jews. And the Sephardic Jews are basically Jews from Portugal and Spain and that area. And Ash Ashkenazi are the people who, who were first in the north of Israel and then they moved westward to Central Europe and they, they moved towards Germany and Poland and all those people. So you have these two groups, Ashkenazi, Germans, German Jews, uh, Polish Jews, and you have the Sephardic Jews who are from Spain and Portugal. But now, because of what Hitler did and everything, they uh, they came together, they united. So again, just this is to do with the sons of Goma. Ashkenaz was the first one that's mentioned. Then you have um, Rip, Rip, Rip Hap and Togarma. The sons of Javan, these are the people of Greece. Elisha, Tarshish, Kitim, and Dodanim. Tarshish my, probably rings a bell in our heads because we know of one of the prophets who was supposed to go to the city of Nineveh, but then ended up trying to take a ship and flee to Tarshish, which was like 2,000 miles away. And I'm referring to Jonah. So some of these names are familiar. And then you have Kittim and then Dodanim, all the sons of Javan. From these coastland people spread in their lands, each with, its, with his own language by their clans in their nations. So they spread all over and now we're moving on to the sons of Ham who most likely is the youngest based on the previous chapter. So the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put and Canaan. And the, the sons of Cush probably are, are, are the same people as the people of modern Ethiopia. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Rama and Sabteka. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. So the, now he's moved on to the sons of Ham. And um, these are the people who, who, uh, who moved to the east, the west, and the southeast of Mesopotamia. The, many of these people moved to uh, Egypt and Africa and Libya and uh, we told that Cush fathered this guy called Nimrod. And it says in verse 8, I think it is, he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. And then it says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And we think that, oh, what a powerful man in all those things, which he was. But I think that he was not for the Lord. He was against the Lord. He, he was a mighty hunter in the face of God or in opposition towards God because his name means rebel or somebody who says, let us rebel. So he wasn't somebody who was a close follower or disciple of God, but he was a, he was a head hunter. Basically, he went around hunting people and he was killing the sons of men. And in fact, one Jewish Targum says this, it says he was powerful in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord, for he was a hunter of the sons of men. And uh, he used to say, depart from the judgment of the Lord and adhere to the judgment of Nimrod. So he was a man who, who was full of himself. And he was a powerful man, but an evil, wicked man. So he's full of wickedness. And so in that sense, he was a mighty hunter against the Lord. That would be a more accurate translation. Before the Lord, meaning in his face. So that is Nimrod for us. And 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 uh, he was, when we read on over here, let me just read that verse. It says in verse 10, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. From that land, he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Er, Kala, and Resin between Nineveh and Kala. That is the great city. So he is the ruler of both Babylon, Babylonia and Assyria, those two places or nations that took the Israelites, the Jewish people captive. In 722 BC, we have Assyria that came down and took the 10 northern tribes of Israel. 605 BC, 586 BC, you have under Nebuchadnezzar, he comes, the Babylonians come and take the two southern tribes of Judah and they take them back to Babylonia in captivity. So Nimrod was the ruler of these two uh, places that came that later. So again, it further solidifies the whole idea that he was against the Lord, not for him. He was not a mighty hunter who glorified God, but he was rather against him. 
and he did his own thing. So let's read on some more verses now. Verses 11. No, no. Verses 13. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naftu, Naftuhim, Patrush, Patrusim, Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaptorim. So, a lot of difficult names to pronounce over here. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the uh, Amorites, the Girgashites, and the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvadites, the Zemarites, and the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed. And the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, and their lands, and their nations. So again, a lo lo lot of, lot of uh, names listed for us, you know, under... under uh, Ham itself, you have 30 different nations. Under Japheth, we had 14. Under Ham, you have 30. And then Shem later, 26. So all these are recorded for us. And like that archaeologist once said, see, uh, we wonder sometimes why all this is recorded for us. Because this is how, you know, the people spread out after the flood. One archaeologist, William F. Albright, said, the 10th chapter of Genesis stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel even among the Greeks where we find the closest approach to a distribution of people in the genealogical framework. The table of nations remains an astonishingly accurate document. So he says that this document that we have in Genesis 10, this is a famous archaeologist, William F. Albright, and he says that it's completely unparalleled. The first people to who have known to take this approach where they bring all these genealogical genealogical records together is the Greek people. But he says that that it come it's it's nothing when it compares to Genesis chapter 10 because the the record is so accurate over here. God has preserved all this and this is how all of us and all of us can trace our lineage back to one of one of these groups or maybe a combination due to intermarriage. But you can trace back your lineage to one of these three sons or maybe they intermarried in a combination of them either it's shem ham or jacob and from shem we have the semitic race we saw the descendants of ham now we'll read also to shem this is the one so from verses 21 onwards the book of genesis which when whenever we ask what is the theme of Genesis, many people will say it is the book of beginnings. And they're absolutely right. It is the book of beginnings. It describes the creation and all that. But from verse 21 onwards, now the book of Genesis is going to become a book of talking about how through this Semitic race, I think uh, through, through the Semitic race will come Nahor. Nahor will father Terah. Terah will father Abram. Abram will marry Sarai. Their names will later be changed to Abraham and Sarah. And from there, they have J Isaac and Jacob. And from Jacob come the 12 tribes of Israel. So the And the reason is because they're all awaiting that promise in Genesis 3.15. The, you know, there will come a deliverer who will crush the head of the serpent and he will bruise his heel. They're waiting for the Messiah to come. So the rest of the, from this point onward, it's really going to be focused. Now we're talking about the sons of Japheth, we were talking about the sons of Ham, but now we're going to be talking about the sons of Shem, and from there on, the Old Testament is the history of how it all leads up to the Messiah, the people of Israel, and how they were taken into captivity, how they didn't listen to the prophets, and all those things. We have history, uh, history in the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. So to Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, and you know, some linguists say this is where we get the word Hebrew from, Eber. The elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, and again, Elam is a group where we think, I mean, we think the, the linguists think that the Aramaic language comes. And they spoke Aramaic during the time of Daniel. Daniel probably spoke Aramaic. And Jesus and his disciples also probably spoke Aramaic. So Elam, the Elamites, were probably um, came, uh, invented that language called Aramaic. Ashur, 
Arpa, Arpa, Kshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz. And again, the name rings a bell because who is from the land of Uz? Job was from the land of Uz. Hul, Gepa, and Mash. Arpa, Arpa Shad fathered Shela, and Shela fathered Eber. So Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. It's interesting that only some people get a little bit more explanation. Like Nimrod, suddenly there's a long explanation. Now one guy is named Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Nobody else gets these kind of descriptions. They're just named. But then certain individuals, there's a little bit explanation given as to what they did or what was happening during the earth, uh, or what was happening on the earth during that time. And his brother's name was Jokhtan. Jokhtan fathered Almodad, Shelef, Hazar Mavet, Jera, Hadoram, Uzal, Dikla, Obal, Abimel, Sheba, Ophir, Havila, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sefar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. So we have here divisions of language, divisions of families, divisions of nations or ethnicities. And uh, so in, in chapter 10, you have 70 nations, basically. God describes... 70 nations and he it's interesting because these are the 70 nations that he recorded for us that spread out over the earth and also repopulated the earth physically it's just interesting to note that in luke chapter 10 jesus sends out 70 disciples luke 10 1 and 2 i think sends out 70 disciples but there it is to evangelize the world spiritually. Here it's to repopulate physically, but there it is to evangelize spiritually. So just interesting to make that uh, observation. So 70 nations named over here. As you saw, some of the names, for me at least, are really difficult to pronounce. But we can all trace our line back to one of these um, groups, one of these people groups. We, since we're, we we went, got through this chapter, we'll just do a f the first few verses of chapter 11 and then we'll finish. 11 1 says, now the whole earth had one language and the same words, which is kind of expected because they all came from the boat. I mean, just Noah, his three sons and the wife. So they all spoke one language and they, and they had the same words. They could communicate clearly. They understood each other really well. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. So, they, uh, you know, even in English itself, we have 22 official languages, but, and of course, hundreds and hundreds of dialects, but 22 officially recognized languages. And you, you can, if you drive 500, 600 kilometers in any direction, it's almost like you're a foreigner unless you're bilingual and trilingual. But you can't even communicate if you go to, if I go to Telangana, I go to Hyderabad, I, I'm clueless there because I'm not able to communicate in the local language, which is Telugu. But at that time, there was just one language they could all communicate. They go to Shainar, which is another word for Babylonia. They gather together and they say, let us build to God. Now, Babylon, Bab, uh, Babel, Babel means in their language, in the Babylonian language, it means gateway to heaven. But in the Hebrew language, it means confusion, which is interesting. You know, what is man's view and what is God's view about man? These two are contrasted just in one name. So um, they rebel. It, they're rebelling because now when you read Genesis 11, 1, 2, 3, and you see, well, what's wrong in building a city? They just say, let's build bricks. And, you know, they want to build a city. What's wrong is that God told them to spread out and fill the earth, especially Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. He said, multiply, be fruitful, be multiply. The same commandment that he gave to Adam and Eve. He says the same thing. He wants them to fill the earth, but here they're coalescing. They're coming together and uh, they're merging. And for fallen human beings like this to always come together, there's all, there'll always be something dangerous in the offing. 
always something where they're going to now plot together and they're going to come up with something, which is what they do in verse four. They say, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. It's not necessarily that they thought they would reach the heavens where God is. But they're basically saying, let's observe the heavens. Let's build a really high tower and we'll observe the known heavens of that time. They will, we, we'll see for ourselves rather than... And what's interesting is they use this uh, bitumen for mortar, which is basically the same thing that if you look in Genesis 6, God told Noah to use to waterproof the ark. It's the same thing that uh, Moses' mother used to make that basket, to waterproof the basket before she let it float on the Nile when she, where she put uh, the baby Moses uh, and he was floating, later discovered by uh, Pharaoh's daughter. So it's interesting that they're using this waterproofing material almost as if suggesting that they don't believe the promise of God that he would never flood the earth again. And they're saying that even in, in the case that a flood comes back, we want to waterproof this tower. We want to ensure that we are safe and there's a place for us. And we want to show it, it's kind of in rebelling because they're not listening to his commandment. And they're all coming together, not listening to his commandment to go spread out and fill the earth. So they say, let's, Build a city and a tower with a stop in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. And that's the key there, for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. That, there, there it is. They don't want to be dispersed over the face of the earth. They all want to come together, use this common language, harness this common language, leverage this common language. And the Lord came down, it says, verse 5, to see the city. It's interesting language, could be an anthropomorphism, where, you know, it's just talking in our observational language, the Lord came down, or it really could mean that the pre-incarnate Christ or, yeah, the pre-incarnate Christ most possibly, and we'll see that right through the book of Genesis where the pre-incarnate Christ, the pre, mm, before Jesus took on uh, flesh and came, uh, I mean, took on flesh being born of a virgin, there were many times like the angel of the Lord is referring to the pre-incarnate Christ. And you'll see that right through the book of Genesis. So it's very possible that God took on human form over here, took on a body and came down just to observe what man, not that he did not know, but just from to experience what they're doing. Verse six, and behold, they are one people and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do now will be impossible for them. When evil men come together, when fallen men come together, there's a lot of power that they have in their unity. And when it comes to devising evil schemes, and you, if you just look at history, just in the 20th century, one of the bloodiest centuries of all the centuries, all the all the dictators, all the all the evil people. When evil people come together, they can do a lot of damage. And so God says, if they come together. And, they, and they, nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. And then come, let us, again, possibly a reference to the triune God, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. And I, I don't know exactly how God did it, but it's God who gives us language. I mean, there are some, there are so many different languages. And I think that God miraculously gave us that, that ability to come up with these languages and in some way, he confuses their languages so that they don't understand one another's speech. He did this so that in verse 8, uh, he could disperse them from there over all the face of the earth. And this is also because now he's not going to come and destroy them with a flood because of what they're deciding to do, because he promised he would never do that. So he uses another way where he confuses the language so that they would carry out that commandment. And uh, they th and dispersed from over there, from all the face of the earth, and they left off the building. They left off the building, the city. Left off building the city, excuse me. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. Even the historian Herod Heroditus, who lived probably in the four, around circa 400 BC, said that he saw this Tower of Babel. So it was there for a long time. Um, God confuses the language and he basically does it because they did not believe in the promise uh, of God. And so again, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful reminder for us to trust God's promises that um, what he says will come to pass and that we can we can trust him. And when, when he gives us a commandment not to 
not to congregate and you know make our own device because i was thinking when i was reading about this genesis 11 how when there are so many amazing things that man has done today if you look at some of the the science the technology and the, the advancements all the things mobile phone all these things of course it's it's only through the brains that god has given him but these are we're talking about secular men coming together so you, something like that happens over here they're all smart yes their brains are given from god but all these men are uh, ungodly men who are coming together they're putting their brains together and they're doing they're carrying out this act where they're building this tower and not only the tower even the city included where they they want to disobey and stand in opposition against god who said go and fill the earth scatter and fill the earth and they want to congregate together and they want to come together and they want to say we'll build a tower to the heaven so that's what happens when many people come together in that passion so and now i'd like to hear some of your thoughts uh, about genesis 10 and 11 if you have any kindly feel free to unmute and share 